Hello and a very warm welcome to the Managing Chronic Pain webinar. Your presenter today is Associate Professor Malcolm Hogg and I'm your facilitator, Nicola Graham. Um, I'd like to invite you to ask any questions during the webinar. You'll see that you have an orange arrow here, which you can use to maximize or minimize your control panel. If you maximize it, then you get an opportunity to um, open up this question bar and you can type in your question text here. So really encourage you to ask um, any questions that you might have. And the questions, I'll just use your first name when I um, ask those questions of, of Malcolm. So I'd like to just start with an acknowledgement and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians past and present on whose lands we meet today. And we acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. So I'd like to introduce you to our presenter today, Associate Professor Malcolm Hogg, and we're very fortunate to have Malcolm. I know he's had back-to-back -back presentations today. So, um, And Malcolm is the Head of Pain Services at Melbourne Health, the Clinical Associate Professor, Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne, and the Staff Specialist Anesthesia and Pain Management at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And Malcolm's research interests include early identification and management of people with acute pain at risk of developing chronic disabling pain. And Associate Professor Hogg is a current board member of Pain Australia and was a past president of the Australian Pain Society. He's coordinating the Waiting in Pain Project, a systematic investigation into the provision of persistent pain services in Australia. So just a note here about informed choice, and I'm now just going to change screen and uh, turn my webcam off and hand over to Malcolm. So Malcolm, you'll get that uh, dialogue box for you to accept so that we can then show your presentation. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Malcolm. Right. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I have done this previously through MS Connect, and I suppose what I was hoping to sort of um, talk about today are some general concepts about how we interpret a pain presentation, then influencing how that, that influences us when we approach someone with MS and pain is high uh, incidence in MS. And then the treatment strategies. And in particular, of late, there's been a lot of discussion about cannabis. So I actually have included quite a bit of information in the slide set on cannabis. Um, the reason for that is that there's been some studies showing that 75% of people presenting for cancer care want to know about cannabis. Yet the knowledge base of those presenting uh, presenting to is very poor, and physios and other allied health and nursing staff are commonly more accessible and often a first point of call for patients rather than medical practitioners. And so I think it's important that the allied health teams involved in healthcare understand sort of the perspectives and have some basic uh, knowledge around cannabis and where it fits in the treatment regime. Um, there is more information in the slides than what I'm going to present, so I will talk through or skip over some slides. As mentioned, there's a number of things that I participate in, including the uh, pharmaceutical industry and have been involved more recently with the Department of Health here in Victoria and the TGA with regards to their response to the opioid issues. So one of the biggest uh, points of uh, discussion with the junior doctors and from many of the senior doctors as well and uh, allied health is understanding this variation between a structural concept and a neurophysiological and to remove the sort of the stigma of, well, it's all in your brain, it's all in your, all in your head. Um, in some ways that is true, but it's neurological and that, that, that social aspects of a pain presentation can have a neuronal impact or correlation. So summary here is that pain assessment should be considering the person and the pathology 
knowing that those psychosocial factors may or essentially do have a neurological basis. And that pain is therefore a multi-dimensional experience where there's just not just sensory, but there's a other components within the brain that make up the clinical pain presentation. And that's relevant for both acute, subacute and chronic pain settings. And then for the person who has multiple sclerosis, they may have pain and a normal sensory system, but over time, they tend to develop an abnormal sensory system, which puts them at risk of chronic central neuropathic pain. And they've always, or everyone is at risk of secondary pains, whether that be musculoskeletal or visceral pain syndrome. So MS patients can have pain just like anyone else from back pain or from appendicitis. So we need to be cognizant of that. So if you look at the neurology perspective, we know that there can be, um, I might just move that out now, okay. I'm just gonna move that out of my screen. Not sure if it's in your screen. So we know that um, there's neuronal activation with no susception. And so with that, we have activation at multiple areas of the brain, but in general, there's a sensory component in the somatosensory area, there's an affective component, insular, amygdala, anterior singular cortex, and there's an evaluative component. And so we evaluate what this sensory experience means and we assess the threat value. And nociceptive pain re really reflects the, the threat. And if you can override that threat or you can prioritise the threat, you will get analgesia from a top-down response. Whereas clinical pain is the clinical presentation where there has been changes that have developed. And so in the short term, it's peripheral inflammation. So there's tissue damage, there's wound sensitivity, and we call that primary hyperalgesia. If it's poorly controlled for long enough, you'll get upregulation of the spinal cord, and we'll refer to that as secondary hyperalgesia, and that can include glial cell activation. So it can activate a neuroinflammatory response within the spinal cord that increases the risk of having persistent pain. And then there's this third group that I've often thought about as tertiary hyperalgesia, but it's now being uh, reported as supraspinal sensitization. That is where the perception at the higher brain level is heightened and prolonged and upregulated. So think about an injury uh, that might be from falling down the stairs. That falling down the stairs might have been your own fault due to being silly or missing a step or not concentrating, or it might be that you were part of a, a violence or torture sort of situation where you were pushed down the stairs. Same injury fracture, peripheral limb fracture, but different brain response. And over time, you can upregulate your brain in your evaluative areas, and you can have developed supraspinal sensitization because you weren't necessarily the cause of that injury and that pain experience. So we feel this is part of the linkages and part of a, a, a way to explain those associations that we see between previous trauma, um, the psychosocial factors associated with the pain experience and their longevity or persistence. In addition, clinically, we see sleep, mood, fear avoidance, hypervigilance, and that's, again, biological. We, we need to be hypervigilance if you're in a threat situation uh, for in order for the organize, organism to survive. And then, at a top-down level, we should be inhibiting it, but potentially we might be facilitating pain and that we've demonstrated that catastrophizing and anxiety can both increase the ability to upregulate and decrease the ability to downregulate. So if I'm approaching someone in the postoperative period versus someone in the clinic, I will be considering what their, their nervous system or their neurological or their nociceptive spectrum is like when I'm assessing their current pain, because then I should be targeting my treatment towards that. So factors associated with pain severity and persistence is severe, poorly controlled acute pain. That remains the biggest predictor because it reflects neuronal input into the spinal cord and the ability to upregulate the spinal cord. But then the next four or five, six different factors all appear to be psychosocial. Is there um, childhood, poor childhood experiences? Is there a... Uh, uh, past pain and pain cognitions? Is there a lot of catastrophizing involved? Is there compensation involved? Is there perceived injustice? 
a, a, a genetic link is suggested, but this is actually partly through anxiety and catastrophizing. So when they say, well, my mother had pain, the linkage appears to be at least partly through changing catecholamines and, and having a higher association with catastrophizing, which is the same risk factor for developing a higher risk of having persistent pain. There's a small, you know, a smaller group of people who have neuroinflammatory conditions, and you see them with uh, people with reactive asthma, migraine, ACE inhibitors. They have all a prominent inflammatory response to stimulation, in part through neurogenic inflammation, and they're more likely to develop chronic pain after a new pain experience. So these changes have led on to the concept of pain is more than just nociceptive or arthritic or inflammatory, but it can be neuropathic from nerve injury or can be from hyperperception. So the nervous system upregulates itself and refers to as nociplastic, where there's a change in function. The reality is there's always some degree of upregulation occurring. It's just how prominent that is. So for some people, their pathology's got better, but they're highly distressed and they have high pain complaints. They may have a high component of nociplastic pain and a low component of no, uh, um, nociceptive pain. I'm going to move through the next slides, but this essentially talks about this physiology, about what are the, the uh, receptors involved and takes goes further to look at the ability to upregulate or the ability to downregulate pain. And one way to downregulate, testing downregulation of pain is putting your hand in a bucket of cold water. You will say that's wet, it's cold, it's painfully cold. You'll keep it there, keep it there, keep it there, keep it there, and you're activating your descending inhibition. And your ability to do that can predict how you respond to surgery. Athletes, military personnel, you can train this to some degree. You can actually train it out of people by abusing them as child, children. And so people with childhood trauma often, or torture victims, have a lower ability to downregulate this, uh, their brain systems, uh, downregulate nociception. So we like to know theoretically what their nociceptive spectrum is. So if your ability, your baseline is higher, your ability to upregulate is higher, and your ability to downregulate, called conditioned pain modulation, is weaker, you're pro-nociceptive and you're more likely to develop chronic pain. Catastrophizing, as mentioned, appears to work at, at least partly through these mechanisms. So that leads us to how do you assess someone with pain? And so clinically, I approach it as who is the person? What are the mechanisms of their pain? And what's the impact of their pain? So when we're looking at who's the person, what's their education status? What was their childhood like? Are they anxious? What's their neuronal sort of responses? How have they responded to pain previously or, or a pain event? What are the psychosocial factors that are associated with increased risk of disability and distress? Are they there? Other things include comorbidity. So do they smoke? If they smoke, then that suggests that they're more inflammatory. They might have an anxiety disorder. Um, what are the mechanisms? So most often pain starts as nociceptive, where it's a threat, but there may also be a neuropathic component and how much of its upregulated system and nociplastic component. Red flags come in here, but so do uh, yellow flags to some degree. So is there red flags indicating possible serious medical conditions? And then what's the impact? So in acute pain, it's about cardiovascular respiratory issues, maybe metabolic. In more subacute pain, it's about stopping deconditioning. In chronic pain, it's about well, what's been the impact on your family, your employment, your sleep pattern, your mood, your weight. Second part of pain is where is this person on their journey? What would you expect them to be? Are they going as you would expect? And this comes out of a lot of work on a um, couple of things. One is often neuropathic pain is missed or the trajectory is delayed. The second is the workers' compensation status. Uh, if you follow people after acute pain, they tend to get better, they're getting better, they're getting better. Oh, hang on, they're not getting so much better anymore. Oh, they might be worse now. Oh, they're highly distressed and disabled. And that change may occur between six and 12 months in that setting. And 
we often expect them to get better and are surprised when they don't. And so if patients are not following the expected journey, we need to reassess them and we'd be looking for tissue recovery or re-injury. We're looking for nerve injury that might be missed. We're looking for social responses and interactions that may be changing their neurological state. I talked this morning to some medical students about shingles. The shingles pain is different in the acute setting from day one, day three, day five, there's an inflammatory component, then it becomes a nerve component and then it can the mechanisms of the pain are changes in the journey from acute shingles to chronic post neuralgia. So the mechanisms are different. Same concept for people with post-trauma pain. Acute pain is different to this, you know, six weeks post-op, post-trauma to six months to three years. They might still have pain all the way through there, but the mechanisms of the pain are different in those different, different uh, time points. And I think this is relevant to MS. MS, you can have acute neuropathic pain, but then you can also develop different components of pain in the journey of someone with MS. The flag system is not just red and yellow flags, but there's orange, blue and black flags related to the workers' compensation. So then how do you manage it? You manage it from anti-perception by giving them education and understanding, including the healthcare team. You look at the pharmacology. Opioids are really for nociceptive pain and they fail, they tend to fail, but not completely, but they tend to fail or have had been trouble in long-term chronic pain complaints for a couple of reasons, but one of it includes tolerance to opioids, but the second is that the mechanism of the pain, chronic arthritic is different to someone with an acute arthritic nociceptive problem uh, issue. So that opioids may work acutely, less effective long-term. non steroidal biologicals, antioxidants are those where there's obvious inflammation, Regionals, ketamines, clonidine, tricyclic nerve drugs are those where there's neural sensitization or nerve injury. Neuron non-pharmacological treat pain at multiple levels. So physical rehab, re-exposure and desensitization is helpful at both top levels, but also spinal cord and likely peripheral. Psychological assessment and management is good from a top-down control point of view. Social is good from repeat, uh, reducing the ability to upregulate. And if you take it one step further to look at just the drugs and the other treatments, things like sensory motor retraining, helpful at the brain level. Same with um, antioxidants, so they stop that upregulation. But down the bottom here is cognitive training to modify the perception. And just the bottom here, I've got cannabinoids. And this is because there's evidence that cannabinoids and mindfulness don't change the sensory experience, but they change the unpleasantness component and so yep it hurts but I'm not so fussed by it anymore so you're either sitting on a beach meditating feeling the sand and you're not worried about your back pain or you've taken too much TAC and you're lying on the couch and it doesn't bother you anymore similar mechanism of action this slide is about the difficulty in the trials and we will say nothing works. The trial, there's no evidence for that. And part of that is because if you look at an, a, a population base, there's a lack of evidence across the, the population, but within that population, there appears to be responders, whether it be to paracetamol, opioids, this example is low back pain. So the message is, I've got a person with pain, I'm gonna run through a number of treatment options, but I'm expecting the only a 30% response. 30% of people will respond to 30 to 50% pain relief. Probably a third of people will get a side effect and they won't maintain it. And then another third of people won't get any benefit at all. So you need to be prepared to, to run through a number of strategies and often mix and match the strategies to get optimal outcome. Impact of all pain becomes more complex and that includes biopsychosocial. I'm gonna move past this. The fear avoidance model we think about as a one way thing, but it's not. It's about balance of the protective factors and managing it and the risk factors. I think Nathan Backley, he accepted all the negative aspects of his players and promoted the positives. So idea is let's boost up the, 
the protective factors, resilience and protective and the family issues and try to manage the risk factors. I'm going to move past this, just really a slide to break things up a bit. You might think of any questions based on that sort of first section before I'm going to talk about MS. So MS is an inflammatory central nervous system disease with resultant demyelination. It would appear to be complex with both genetic and environmental factors involved. There may be a trigger or trigger for those at risk. White matter plaques are the characteristics, but I think it's also important to recognise there are other changes in the brain and it's not just about the number or size or the position of the plaques, but there's other changes happening and they refer to you know, blurring of the, of the uh, white grey matter on MRI. And so there's some gliosis and inflammation happening in the grey matter. It's not just all about the white matter or the, or the axonal parts of it. The changes can occur both in spinal cord, but also brainstem um, and the upper cortical structures. And then there's a smaller uh, aspect of MS where the inflammation appears to go onto the nerves. So there's a component of neural inflammation. This is most commonly seen in the upper area, so the optic trigeminal glossopharyngeal. So there can be neuronal inflammation. It's not just a brain disease or a spinal cord disease. There's this unexplained association with colder temperatures it's really coming away from the equator, but then there's some variations there. The Palestinians have a higher rate than the Maoris, so there's a genetic influence there. So it's, it's very difficult to understand. There appears to be some markers in this sort of CNS, you know, blood markers and see what's in the CSF, but they're not consistent. So it's likely there's more than a couple of different mechanisms happening and that a person's MS might be different, one person's MS might be different to another person's MS in actual mechanism. There's variable courses, these are the groups grouping. Relapsing remitting is the general, the largest group, may start off benign, might be very infrequent. Some people have this concept of clinically isolated syndrome, which I think was mostly missed beforehand. Um, I had someone the other day who presented post-pregnancy with symptoms, but on the history had had an episode of something, you know, eight years previously. So is this the second episode to make it MS or is this the first episode? I think possibly it happens and you get this neural inflammatory response from some trigger and then it goes away and there's likely people out there who are completely asymptomatic, who never have another condition, uh, an episode and they've had an episode of you know, brain inflammation that could be called clinically isolated syndrome. But they are likely at risk of having a recurrent episode and becoming a relapsing remitting type MS. And if it's really aggressive and it continues, then you would call it primary progressive or if it develops into a progressive form, it's a secondary progressive. There are some variations. Devic's disease is the one that I've most seen, which is neuromyelitis optica, whereas more spinal cord um, isolated changes and they get a lot of lower limb spasticity. So how do we see it? It's basically neurological symptoms. So hypoesthesia, paresthesia and pain. Pain is very common and a part of the presentation can be pain, acute neuropathic pain. Um, without signs on the MR of uh, any changes. Uh, motor can be weakness, spasms, clonus and poor coordination and planning, can be autonomic symptoms, upper, limb, upper CNS bulbar symptoms, visual. And things that we possibly don't quite uh, respect would be those emotional aspects, so cognitive impairment, concentration, fatigue, lability, vertigo, these things that are sort of just soft sort of symptoms, often patients report it, we can't prove it on, on examination, so we don't often take it seriously enough, but patients know they're not, they may not be thinking 
well or properly. Secondary effects from multiple sclerosis are obviously falls and injury, um, fatigue, uh, and the, the implications at a psychosocial level. Treatments quite aggressive now, disease modifying drugs. I don't know them all. There's always there's um, immunosuppressant type strategies that can have other risks of immunosuppression, of, of, of complications of immunosuppression. And then there's symptomatic management about spasticity, continence, pain, and the need for rehabilitation. Pain in MS is common, occurs in 20% of those with their first episode of MS, reflecting acute brain and or nerve root irritation or inflammation. And then it's common in the chronic cohort. Uh, Solero's group recently did a more active, I suppose, or, or recent cohort of people with MS. And I suppose the modern MS patient, and it's a little bit lower than had been prescribed before, sort of 40%, 30 to 40% having at least one type of pain. Okay. But in the older studies, it goes up to sort of 70, 80% of people with MS develop or have, have pain report. And treatment load, when you talk to the chronic pain, but they, they take all these pills. And I actually saw the ABC documentary on um, Doug Anthony All-Stars the other night and they're talking about Tim Ferguson having MS and it showed him taking his pills and he was saying he has 21 pills in the morning and you know 28 at night or something you know it was in that ballpark and he had all these so when they look at the medication requirements 30% of all medication requirements and treatment requirement relates to their pain so it's a big thing for the patients <clears throat> Pain appears to be correlated to both disability, so if they're more likely to be disabled if they have pain, it's more likely the older the patient and more associated with disease course or duration. So you, when you look back at Solero's paper and others' paper, the younger cohort on these disease-modifying drugs, the new modern MS patient, they've likely got a lower report and lower risk of having chronic pain. MS pain has been classified as central neuropathic, then subclassified as continuous or intermittent, classified as musculoskeletal. I'd actually say that that's not quite clear cut, and then mixed neuropathic, non neuropathic. And I'd actually think some of the musculoskeletal pain is in that mixed non neuropathic, uh, mixed neuropathic, non neuropathic pain complaint. So the biggest uh, pain issue we deal with in MS is central neuropathic pain. And this uh, is influenced by disease modifying drugs. I've put that picture there incorrectly, but 14 to 45% of MS cohort. So you're looking at an average of sort of 20 to 40%, and it increases the longer you go. Uh, the continuous component appears to be spinothalamic dysfunction. We see that post-stroke and other uh, spinal cord injuries where if the injury or the stroke is in the area causing spinothalamic or somatosensory dysfunction, then that increases significantly increases the risk of central neuropathic pain. And in general, it's felt to be required. In MS, it's not always defined that way or we can't clearly demonstrate it uh, and that likely reflects that white grey matter aspect of MS or there's some dysfunction occurring in MS that we can't see on MR or clinical exam but they've got pain because of it. This is more likely in lower limbs and upper limb, it's a dyslexic or an unpleasant situation. I see also a continuous group uh, with spinal cord lesions often on the chest wall so they may have a low cervical plaque and they'll have an opposite area on the chest wall of central spinal cord neuropathic pain. Then there's the intermittent group and this relates to trigeminal glossopharyngeal neuralgia, uh, Lamette's phenomena and Untoff's phenomena which is where there's pain variability based on heat or pain variability based on movement. 
and likely the mechanism here is different to the continuous neuropathic pain. So the intermittent neuropathic pains might be neuronal uh, activity and spontaneous activity. So they may respond better to things like sodium channel blocking drugs versus the continuous group probably respond better to a centrally acting tricyclic or um, gabapentinoid. Malcolm, I've got a couple of questions here, if you don't mind me yep. interrupting. Yep. Yep. And the first one is, um, how do your patients describe that central neuropathic pain feels like for them? Yeah, so they will have great difficulty describing it to you. So they'll say it's a squeezing, it's just, it's gnawing, or it's, it's just, they'll s screw up their face. Um, it's often deep. And whilst they talk about neuropathic being looking for paresthesias and touch evoke pain and those classical things about nerves, it's often a deep sensitivity. So you think, oh, is that the bones? But what it's reflecting is sensitivity of the nerves around the bones. So periosteal sensitivity. And so they'll have a, sometimes they'll have a deep dis discomfort or, or ache and that can be neuropathic. It's not always classically shooting, tingling, burning, you know, touch of oak pain. Okay. Thank you. And then this one is a little bit of a, a light-hearted question, I think, it, and it's asking for clarica clarification. Is there no yep. difference in experience of pain in MS between men and women? Uh, what we're saying is there's no... Uh, if you look at chronic pain per se, it would appear that women are more prevalent in having chronic back pain or post-surgical pain. Uh, it's not clearly, but it, but it's in most studies, the instance of chronic pain is higher in women than men, um, felt at least partly to be hormonal. Now, if you take out the idea that MS is more frequent in women, the rates of pain appear to be similar between men and women um, in MS, uh, and probably the experience is, is similar. There, there's no reason why it wouldn't be uh, different, um, but it's the age. So it's the age of the person rather than their gender or sex that, that affects whether they report pain. Okay, great. Thanks, Malcolm. So the other aspect of pain is it in you know, any other condition, so musculoskeletal, and obviously they get spasms and spasticity, and that there's both, and spasms, part of spasms is that there's a peripheral nerve dysfunction causing that upregulation, those sudden spasm events, and then there's spasticity, which is mostly a central mechanism. And both of those can be associated with pain, and you think of it as muscular, well, this is a musculoskeletal pain complaint. Well, it's actually a bit more than that. It's it's that feedback loop of muscles going into activity. It's feeding back a hyper, through a hypersensitive nervous system and you're getting a pain complaint. You can get pure musculoskeletal issues from contractures and joint fibrosis and sitting in a wheelchair, for example, uh, for long periods of time. Visceral pain complaints can occur, particularly long-term, when you've got longer-term bladder dysfunction, bladder stones, you get constipation that may not be well-managed and that can cause pain. So it's not just about central neuropathic pain, it's these other aspects. And then headache occurs in, you know, 20% of people with MS. We see this in post-concussion as well, and you and you talk about, you know, you hear those acute footballers having post-concussion headache, yet we're taught in, you know, in uni that the brain is insensitive. You know, the brain doesn't feel anything, and you can have a brain tumour without any pain. But once it hits the meninges or it causes pressure, you can get headaches. So how does MS cause headaches? I suspect it does it through inflammation. So by actually having inflammation, it's causing sensitization within itself in the nervous system through the inflammatory aspect. And that headache may be a presenting symptom of acute MS. Um, Secondary issues can be that you get meningeal aspects. So, so while the brain is insensate, it can become sensate if it's inflamed. Same thing I think about pancreas. You don't feel your pancreas normally until 
and your cancer of the pancreas is painless until there's inflammation or the capsules involved. So I think if there's inflammation within the brain, you could get a headache. And we see this, I think we see this post-concussion. You've got a concussion, you've got an inflammatory response to that concussion, you get a deep headache post-concussion. So I've just listed some of the mechanisms there. When we assess patients' pain story, I like to think about, well, what are the, what are the driving mechanisms here? Because that's gonna influence my pharmacotherapy in particular. The impact of pain in MS is important. This is Fari Khan's work looking at some people cope with it. We might call them adaptive copers. A cohort, a functional presentation or a phenotype of someone with pain is that they're coping well, they've got good support, they're not distressed, but they've got pain. Another group present to you because they're highly distressed, high pain reports, and they're not functioning. We see that in chronic pain, chronic long cancer pain. And then there's another group with low pain score but high distress levels which may have low support and social aspects and we refer to them as interpersonally distressed. And this sort of phenotype of presentation is quite common in non-cancer as well. So this cohort seen in MS is similar to someone with back pain or back conditions. This was just a Break up slide to look at bone scans. As physios, you'll see people having bone scans. You talk about back pain. Sometimes this can be used to delineate active arthropathy or changes. Now, I want to move on to management and in particular, some of the issues. We've got issues with the care models that we use. We know that we've got diversity between a neurologist and the care team and a pain and multidisciplinary pain team, you've got allied health people, you've got GPs, you've got multiple people involved. You've got a person who's at risk of cognitive impairment who may not take all the education in. Um, and there's always a new treatment. Oh, there's another treatment. There's another thing. There's a research. I've got patients who are going off to Germany to have stem cell transplants, all that sort of stuff. That impacts on their treatment journey. And it can be very hard when they're so focused on getting a stem cell transplant to actually get them to re-educate themselves on pain and to get them engaged in a rehabilitation type program. We know from other experiences with spinal cord injuries and post-stroke that central neuropathic pain is resistant to pharmacotherapy in many situations and the pharmacotherapy only has a limited role or, or you know, limited benefit, but we use it in conjunction with a multidisciplinary care or strategy. Can be very difficult to implement multidisciplinary care in MS just because of the practicalities of getting them there. Allied health principles are to engage the patient in a self-management approach, give them challenge, unhelpful thinking and behaviours, optimise their psychosocial, physical function. Pain programs are used, cognitive CBT restructuring, um, lots of work on posture and gait and looking at the setup. I think something we underdo, which is a prominent in MS, is solicitor systems. By that I mean healthcare, TAC work covers a solicitor system, so getting money reinforces it. Having overzealous partners, um, having uh, you know parent hovering parent is a solicitor system, and that promotes ongoing pain report and disability. And so, a behavioural approach can attack uh, can um, can be directed towards that solicitor system, which means education a family and carers, it means changing the wording, um, it means refocusing. So rather than focusing on the negative and let's talk about your pain, it's actually about what are we doing today and planning and distraction and pacing and, and doing those sort of aspects rather than focus and caring and promoting disability. And that's very important in younger people in the early journey of someone with pain. They can become an active coper, self-managing, doing well, or they can become passive, overly cared for, disabled. Combining pain program aspects includes yoga and tai chi, pilates, where there's motor planning movement, there's posture work, there's mindfulness type components to it. And that has a neurological basis. It's activating brain circuitry that can reduce pain experience at the brain level. You'd be aware of Lorimer's work on explaining pain and there's some support in the literature and neurological stuff that this can be helpful. This would be my approach. Yes, there's a structural component. Patients come to me all the time saying this is structural, but there's an electrical component as well. And this is about sensitization 
and what you're feeling. And we need to wind this part down as much as managing the structural component. Rehab can work. While this is a RCT and it shows benefit, I often sell rehab as saying, well, this is not about getting you better. This is about getting you stable and coping better and allowing you to give you the skills to, to get better and stopping, what's more important is stopping deterioration. If we do nothing in two or three years, you'll be more dependent, you'll have a higher dose of medications, you'll be more reliant on your carer. We need to change that setup so that you're as good as you are now, if not better. A lot of people say, well, physio didn't get me better. I don't care, it's not about getting you better, it's about stopping you getting worse. Can be. Ketamine we use, often used as an inpatient. I'll go past this as good support in acute pain and the transition from acute to chronic pain, less so in chronic neuropathic pain, but there's some case series. So it's common for us with people with poorly controlled MS to, to have them inpatient with neurology, ketamine infusion. Anti-neuropathics are the mainstay of pharmacological treatment in MS. They include gabapentin and a tricyclic. And in general, it's a combination, but they also might include possibly a topical therapy, it doesn't work particularly well in central pain, but this group are second line. So lamotrigine, carbamazepine, valproate. The problems with all of these is adverse effects. So weight gain, peripheral edema, particularly with gabapentin, cognitive dysfunction, um, anticholinergic effects with the tricyclic, rash, gut, and uh, hair loss with valproate and carbamazepine blood test abnormalities, liver test abnormalities. So they often don't, they're often not tolerated well. And given MS patients can have cognitive dysfunction and falls risk, you're giving cognitive drugs to someone with some form of cognitive uh, impairment. Multimodal therapy refers to using smaller doses of two drugs and combining their mechanisms to get better outcome. And in general, a low dose of a tricyclic with a gabapentin, which is flexible, would be our treatment of choice for someone with neuropathic pain, um, particularly central neuropathic pain. Opioids, I'm going to walk through this, but essentially opioids don't work well in chronic pain per se because of adaptation. They have, however, been used for people with high levels of anxiety and psychological distress. There's a high, there's an association. And so if you see someone on high doses of opioids, I automatically think, hang on, there's a psychological anxiety component here. Huge range, got into trouble with misuse, particularly with oxycodone and fentanyl. Buprenorphine is our preferred opioid. It's an atypical opioid. It comes in a patch. It has some evidence in neuropathic pain because it works through a different receptor than just the standard mu receptor and they get less tolerance. The other opioid is tapentadol, known as palexia. Works in part through noradrenaline reuptake. So it has a component which is like an antidepressant and it has a component that's an opioid. So these two drugs we'd refer to as atypical opioids and they were the ones that are being promoted and being used by clinicians as an alternative to the full strength strong opioids. There is an election later this year, you'll soon be seeing advertising brought to you by the Victorian government as a condition called SafeScript, caring for Victorians by implementing opioid monitoring. And this has been released at the beginning of the month and Essentially, opioids, benzos, quetiapine, seroquel, and the Z drugs um, are all being monitored and being we know who's getting them. And if you've got a patient, doctor or pharmacist, they can look up on SafeScript what their opioid prescribing has been. So you'll see ads, ads for that shortly, and that's, that is SafeScript. So this concept of misuse in the community will be addressed by this, and you need to be aware of it. It's nothing to really be worried about. It's a decision type tool. It helps, helps you manage the patient. The risks of addiction are actually probably overblown in the acute setting, but 
those risk factors that develop addiction are similar to the ones that develop chronic pain. So they've high anxiety levels, high distress, significant pathology, more likely to be exposed to opioids, they get an increased risk of having opioid dependence. I'm going to move past this. Antioxidants probably have a role, don't have a problem with it, but very early studies. Um, these are old, but they're, you know, I think there'll be more work done on this shortly. This is just a sort of a breakup slide. Compression and flexion is bad for your back, essentially. And ex-elite athletes get chronic back pain. I want to talk now about two things that you'll come across. Spasticity management, unless there's any, any more, uh, Nicola, is there any more uh, questions at the moment? No, no more questions at the moment, thanks. So spasticity management, I'll talk about briefly and then talk about cannabis. This is a intrathecal pump. So there's a little reservoir here, sits in there, the drug sits in there, there's a little mechanism here that pumps it through this little tube and it gets delivered into the CSF and right onto the spinal cord. It's useful for baclofen. So intrathecal baclofen through this pump system can work at the spinal cord level to decrease the reflex that's contributing to spasticity. And the groups that we use in are those that have got abnormal gait and are struggling with their gait or those that are fully wheelchair bound. And so their positioning care and high, uh, you know, um, perineal hygiene um, because it'll allow legs to be more comfortable and less pain. So we will often utilize it with clonidine and you would test dose to see, you might video them, um, do a timed up and go uh, TARDU scale to say this person is gonna to respond to baclofen and proceed with an intrathecal baclofen pump. Other ways to treat spasticity would be to cut the nerve or give them Botox or even cut the tendon. So there are ways to actively manage spasticity associated with MS, and this should probably be um, thought of, uh, but often neurologists go, well, we'll give you some diazepam or benzo, which doesn't work particularly well and makes patients sedated. So then we've got Sativex, well, we've got cannabis. So some of the early trials of evidence of benefit of cannabinoids has been in MS patients. And in Canada, they brought out Sativex and in England, and this has recently been registered for use in Australia for spasticity in MS. Now, separate to that, there's interest in using it for chronic pain, and 50% of its use overseas is for chronic pain. And interestingly, a third of them are over 60. So it's not the young people you think about, it's the old, graduates of the 60s are going back to it as in the medicinal form. And there's a reason for this. As you age, you get more health-related anxiety and you get sleep disturbance and cannabis benefit appears to be sleep disturbance and anxiety, more so than pain. There's a high patient request for information and that applies across the board, but is seen specifically in cancer group and 75, you know, surveys showed 75% want, want information, but the doctors weren't giving it to them. Physios and chiros and pharmacists are getting asked about this all the time and the next few slides are about giving you that information. Lots of different strains about cannabis. Uh, the main one comes from uh, um, sativa form, but there's heaps of different drugs in there, compounds in there, terpenes and flavor. Terpenes smell, flavonoids give them flavor. Um, variable content of THC, which makes you high, CBD, which is the anti-epileptic, anti-inflammatory, and uh, cannabinol, Canna cannabinol, uh, cannabinol, yeah, and cannabidiol, and then cannabigerol. Now, if you get it illicitly with uh, hydroponics, you're looking at 10% THC and very low doses of CBD, and that's where you get psychoses, whereas if you use a combination with a higher amount of CBD that acts as an anti-inflammatory. It winds down the potency of THC and you do better. High variability rates and often people prefer it in relation because they get very high concentrations and you get psychomedic effects. Uh, it goes through the liver. This is a vaporization, which is theoretically you have to heat the cannabis 
product to make it active. So you can't just eat the leaf, you actually need to heat the leaf and to activate and remove the acid component from THC to then make it psychoactive. And then you can cool it down, but you've got to cook it. And when you cook it, you release the smell. Um, there's different dosing, but most people would be saying, you know, 10 to 30 milligrams a day will give you some benefit, clinical benefit, and have some psychomimetic effects. The clinical pain benefit appears to be correlate quite closely to, to the psychomimetic effects. There are some other health issues, cardiac, um, lactation, pregnancy, hyperemesis, interestingly, in high dose. The evidence is mild to poor in pain reduction. However, there's evidence of improvement in sleep and functional benefit. And the couple of patients we've had, their opioids have come down, they're functioning more. <laughs> One of them said to me, oh, no, I'm now driving. <laughs> I wasn't driving before. And I'm saying, hang on, you shouldn't be driving. But my doses of my opioid doses have come down. I feel much better. And I'm out driving the kids to school. Um, animal models are supportive in spasticity and in, CB, in, in animal models of MS. The CBG component is anti-inflammatory. And it may slow the disease in one animal model in that it reduces this neural inflammation that may be part of MS, but there is no evidence in human trials. THC is what gets you stoned, CBD doesn't get you stoned, but this modifies it and works in a different way. There's randomized controlled evidence supporting mild reduction in spasticity in selected populations, more so than spasms, than having spasticity gain, uh, odds ratio of 1.5 to 2, so it's moderate. Respondent rate, however, is still low, 30 to 40 percent. And the recommendation is you do a four-week trial and you monitor them. We're using a combination of 10 to 20 milligrams of 50 percent THC, CBD, and oil. I believe there's well, there there may be secondary benefits in neuropathic pain, bladder function, and sleep. It reduces bladder. Um, spasticity, uh, reflex. So if people are going to use it in EMS, I would be saying, what's your pain levels? Where is your pain? What's your spasticity? Let's measure your spasticity. What's your walking time? What's your sleep hours? What's your bladder function? Um, what's your anxiety levels? Get a baseline and then you trial it. And it may be that, oh, look, it hasn't helped my spasticity, but it's helped this, this, and this, these other aspects to it. Malcolm, I've got a and, question. Yep. Yep. Sorry, to I've got a question here from Lee. Um, how are you directing clients who want to access cannabis? Are you trialing it with yep. clients at RNH? Yep. yep. Okay. I'm going to get to that. So I'll I will refer to that specifically. And one um, other question that's retrospective. Yep. Could you remind us um, what form has the highest CBD in it? Is it the oil? Um, it doesn't matter. So basically, when you come back to the strains, um, you can develop the strains to have whatever you want in them. Okay, so you have, uh, you know, the hemp grown for uh, commercial um, textiles will have high amounts of other compounds, but it won't who have low amounts of THC. Whereas the bikies have strained up the ones with THC. They've got high concentration of THC, low CBD, and that's more potent. It's more sellable for misuse, you know, for recreational use, but it has higher rates of complications. So what the pharmaceutical, pseudo-pharmaceutical industry is doing is saying, we are bringing different strains together and growing them down to have this combination. And then we're purifying it and combining this as a THC. So they might have so it's like having a blended, you know, vintage. Yeah, I'm going to have 50% coming from my high CBD strain, and I'm having 50% coming from my high THC strain, and I'm combining it to making a 50-50 component. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. So the pharmaceutical aspects are, are leading to that variability, and then we're trying to think of it as prescribing. How much? What's the dose I want to give to this person of THC? What's the dose I want to give of CBD? And so for epilepsy, they're using high dose CBD because that is anti-epileptic and works for people with resistant epilepsy. And we don't want these young kids to be stoned, so we're giving them very low THC. 
we need THC for pain control. So we have, and that appears to be a crucial part of pain control. CBD appears to be important for modifying the adverse effects of THC and having a more prolonged benefit in changing the disease course of chronic pain where there's neural upregulation. Um, so I'll go past it. This is some interesting things here about there's a consumer preference. So when they brought it in overseas, the, all these oldies said, I don't want the one from the bikies that's going to get me stoned. I want the chill out one. And that was found to have the higher CBD group. And so there's a preference for that because it treats their anxiety better. If you have high THC, you get really anxious and paranoid and get agitated. And this is what you see when people misuse synthetic THC products out of Asia that you see in those bong shops, you know, the, the ones with things. And they can cause psychosis because they're really potent at the cannabinoid receptor. Whereas THC is not as potent, and if you mix in CBD, you mellow it out and it becomes preferred in that older cohort. Uh, quality of life appears to improve with some, and in, in some studies it shows reduced opioid use, which goes back to, well, hang on, a lot of people use opioids because they're anxious. And so they're just saying, let's use something that's more anxiety specific, and I need less opioids. Human experimental pain shows that it's the affect component and the most recent paper, it's just been e-published talking about, which is the bottom there, uh, talking about it's actually the unpleasantness of pain that cannabis treats, not the pain experience or the pain sensation. Now an MS is different because it's actually spasticity. Hang on, I've also got central neuropathic pain. Hang on, I've also got a peripheral neuropathic pain complaint. Hang on, I've also got bladder dysfunction. By the way, I don't sleep. I'm highly distressed because I've been told I've got MS and I'm dying and I get a MRI scan by the neurologist every three months. And I, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Have I got more? Have I got more? Have I got more plaques? Cannabis may have a role there in more than one aspect of that experience of MS. Problem is, um, so that shows some reduction in opioids and it has shown some reduced opioid deaths in America. Problem is driving. Can't drive. It's probably um, concerns about the blood levels, particularly early post-use. Uh, post uh, you can get a withdrawal syndrome. Uh, you can, you know, so you get dependent on it. There's about a 25, maybe 50% dose variation. The dose goes up with chronic use. 10% um, get overt addiction. Um, but if you've got all that reasonably under control and then you've got MS, it's probably not unreasonable to say, well, I don't have a problem doing a trial of MS with you. Sativex has been what we call registered. So it's now a registered pharmaceutical product on the ARTG. You don't need to jump through the hoops for it, but it's been registered for moderate severity, moderate to severe spasticity due to MS with inadequate response to other therapy. And it's been recommended for a one month trial with objective assessment. My concern with this drug, and we've used it before, before they made medicinal cannabis accessible, was that you get a very high peak level. So you take it three or four times and you get a high peak level and you go to sleep. Whereas we're now using the oil where you get a very lower level and so you get it spread over, tw over the 12 hour period of the oil and you don't get the high peaks and the troughs. Um, it's still expensive. You still need a permit but you don't need the government to approve it. So neurologists are starting to use this if people can fund it. But remember, this has primarily been indicated for spasticity and I look to see maybe smaller doses spread over the day to see does it help my other aspects of pain, sleep, anxiety. Uh, I've removed what I, else I was gonna say. Now, uh, the TGA, to answer the question about access is that the TGA has a process to access all the other different products. And I'll go back a few slides. So the different products come in, uh, you can inhale it, smoke it, or vaporize it as wedding, as uh, weed and, and flowers, call it, called floss. It comes as an oral mucosal spray, often quicker onset. Inhalation is really rapid onset. 
Oral is the one that we're using, which is slower onset, uh, and but you can also get as a cream or a rectal suppository. And it's coming as variable content and variable purity. And we're trying to use as pure a product as possible, in which case 98% of it is these two drugs and less than 2% is all the other stuff, which is cannabin, uh, cannabinol, cannabigerol and other all these other compounds. So the more purified, the better, uh, we believe, and in an oil form, you have to write to the government to get an approval. So that's through the TGA. I've only got three or four and you have to say what it's for, how you're going to measure it, um, how the patient, you don't have to do that, but the patient has to fund it and what product you're going to use. And then you have to keep them informed every six months. Once you've got a TGA approval for the federal government, you can get a state permit, which is easy. That's through the state government. And as I work in public hospital, I get approval of my hospital to say, I've got a hospital patient I'm going to use, use it on. So I've used it on people with post-cancer pain, high dis dis disability. I've got one MS patient that's done a lot for them. And I've had a couple of cancer patients who have subsequently died uh, and it's helped them. So we're being cautious about it. Uh, we're getting the dosing. We recognise that it is actually, um, and we're going through a consent process to say, this is what we're willing to do and not willing to do. And it's almost like opioids saying, you know, it's this is for you, it's not for others. Um, it's so expensive and they're paying for it Then and they can't drive. They're the two big factors that they don't spread it around or give it to others because it's cheaper to buy it illicitly than it is to get it through the medicinal cannabis route. Good, I'm gonna stop there. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Malcolm. I think we've addressed all the questions that have come up so far. So thank you very much. I'd like to just continue and uh, cover a couple of services. I'm aware that we're at the three o'clock point. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly run through some MS services. So thank you very much, Malcolm. Appreciate your time. Lots of information no in there. And I was Good very to fascinated to see how much the emotional and psychosocial and trauma plays such a significant part in people's experience of pain. So thank you for giving us all that yeah. information. So that, yeah, that's not all, that's the general perspective. And the MS experience is slightly different, isn't it? Because they do have this, this condition and it slowly builds up over many years, but it's how the system around them and the support processes influence and that can influence how they then experience and represent. Yeah, and, and, and important to get their pain managed by, by an expert because it's such a nuanced. Well, uh, the ones that are struggling potentially, but for a lot, they can be managed by their neurologist with a, you know, a bit of good education, good physical activation program, good psychological health and low dose of nerve drugs and they can be fine. It's the ones that get highly distressed and disabled and complicated pharmacotherapy that they're the ones that probably need some multidisciplinary input. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you no very worries. much. No worries. Thanks for your time. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Okay, I just want to complete with a couple of minutes just to cover the services here at uh, MS. And um, we provide a range of services that might be appropriate for your clients, everything from peer support, volunteers, education, NDIS support, employment support services, etc. So please do call us and uh, refer as appropriate. We've got MS practice documents um, here on our website. We are an NDIS provider delivering these services in different states and the access point to all of our services is via MS Connect on this number here. You as a webinar attendee can also access our free eBooks um, and this is how you access them. Um, and if you would like to email us, I can give you this link and these details. We do have other recordings of other webinars available. And again, you can access this through our website, ms.org.au and just click on shop. And here's our number, 1-800-042-138. And you can 
provide that to your clients and call it yourself and access our MS nurses, our MS experts, continence nurses, social workers, MS advisors, etc. So thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.